So I figured, hey, what, what I'd like to do is, if it's okay with you, maybe maybe if you could share a little bit about yourself and, and what made you start up this company, because it's it's really interesting to see how you went from like building this whole sector and and starting it pretty much from scratch for a worldwide entity which is amazing so how did this all get started look it all started because i mean this was my 10th business i'd done a whole series of other businesses which i built up and sold you know, I started when I was 16 years old with my first business and I sort of ended up um, looking for offices and found it was a very, let's call it complicated experience, um, wasn't very customer friendly and I felt there was a better way, there could be a better way that why, why was it that um, you couldn't buy support for your business as a product. You know, why wasn't you had to put it together? And, you know, my background before was either in construction or in factory production or in food production, things like this. And generally speaking, in those markets, you're, you know, creating products that people buy. You don't sort of just you know create things that people have to put together so i could see an opening in the market and that was me looking for an office so then i i researched more came up with the idea wrote a business plan got started um using my own cash i mean there was no um i didn't raise any money um and i opened the first center in brussels in september 1989 and the, the rest is a long history after that. You know, it's not the the sort of journey's not been a flat one since. Now, did this, you know, rent, you know, taking office space, making it co-working, did anyone do this before you? Or you're the first guy who made this happen? First, first one to do it on any scale in any scale. Before there were people doing bits, things like it. Um it was you know, this, you know, basically sharing of office space, basic sharing has been, been around since Roman times. I mean, you can find um, even in, you know, Roman Europe, mm -hmm. um, they had the equivalent of what we do today. I mean, didn't have phones or the internet, uh, but it was just sharing of space. It was an efficient way to do things. And in those days, property was a very high cost very difficult commodity it wasn't something that was sort of everywhere so it had to be used very efficiently and the same today actually driven more by cost and by the environment and so on it you know it's become quite a costly commodity again and quite difficult to use again our job was simply to make it as easy as possible to use it wherever you need it, as opposed to it's all in one place. And that that was the big change. That was my business plan was to open up originally across the capitals of Europe. And, um, you know, that to make it easier to do business in the then, just the beginnings of, of the European Union in 89. Now, did it take off right away or were people initially, you know, Concern, like, hmm, this, this, I'm not used to this. What's going on here? Did you have to overcome some of these objections where people weren't sure in co working space? What is this? How does this work? Took off, took off immediately. Really? First customer was Toshiba, second customer, Bed Atlantic. Third one was KitchenAid. Um, fourth, I just, Basically, I can remember those customers today, um, and some of the customers are still with us. That's amazing. You know, so, you know, basically, it, it sort of hit the mark in terms of what people were looking for. They were looking for property as a service, not as a difficult thing. They just wanted to say, look, 
I need something that's all finished and ready to use. I, I really don't want to be in the property business. I, I just want to, I want to put five people in Brussels and we look after the rest. That's what companies were looking for. And then since then, just kept growing, right? It's And, and well, you have like thousands of spaces now, right? Well, we're just coming up just over 4,000 now, about 4,200 buildings. In, and we're opening up about a thousand a year in 120 countries. So this is a universal problem. It's not just a problem in Europe or in the United States or anywhere. It's a universal problem. Our job is, in fact, to provide an infrastructure. Uh, it's not about space. It's about space and everything else we do. Full technology platform, um, full communications platform, a full support platform with people, help desks and so on to support people doing the work that they're doing for could be small companies, could be the biggest companies in the world. They all want the same thing. They want to have support so that the people using can be much more productive. And it's all for us, when we are looking at things, we're looking at how we can help people's productivity at a lower cost for the for whoever's paying. And that has been the recipe. We're just doing more and more of it. As more people get to know it, more people want to use it. Now, how is it net in today's day where you have return to office, you have remote, you have hybrid? How do you see this playing out? Do you, do you feel that hybrid is going to be the de facto way of doing business for the most part moving forward? Absolutely. Well, it is. I mean, that is proven. It's not. So the narrative's just about catching up today with the reality. And so two months ago, you still had people writing about going back to work, back to the office. In the past month, and right up to there was a McKinsey um uh, a research piece that came out a few days back. And this is alongside Harvard, Stanford, and many, many other research institutions and the industry itself. Uh, their research is saying that hybrid, which means flexible working, will be at least a third of overall real estate. Now, that makes it a $2 trillion total addressable market opportunity. Um, and, and, you know, so it's going to be a huge thing. Now, that realization that it's both permanent and growing is starting to come through. Now, we know because we're talking to thousands of companies that are making the transition, but it takes time. It's not something that happens overnight. Because remember, every company already has leases. It has commitments. Mm -hmm. It's got to get out of those commitments to go over to something new. But it's happening now at pace every month. Um, and, you know, as we make the network deeper, get more coverage, it makes it even more useful for companies to, to make that change. But no, it is permanent. It's going to be a huge part of how people work in the future. It's going to be further enhanced by companies getting much better at, at managing people who are not all in the same office. It's going to be further enhanced by AI that allows very good productivity analysis um, to support managers, managing people doing jobs to, to maximize the productivity, maximize the investment in the people. So it's, it's really moving quickly. Um, it would be further enhanced by IT. Very exciting place to be. All right. Can I, can I, can you indulge me with this for a second? Because you gave me a really, you know, like, like one of those light bulb moments. So you have all these companies that are paying a crazy amount, pick, you know, New York City, let's say, for example, the, you know, the rents are astronomical. People don't want to come back into the office. They want to be at hybrid so that they're going to probably cut back. So that's going to be great for you guys, right? That's going to be great for IWG because you're going to see as these leases come up, tell me if I'm wrong, like as these leases come up, 
they're going to start saying, hey, let's let's maybe get an you know, agreement with you know IWG and Mark, and let's let's set it up there, and this way you have that whole hybrid. That's what's happening. And that then wait, I think you're 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 thinking of going public too, right? So this is that that could be an interesting we're, investment. We're, and I <laughs> we're already public, but yeah, okay. we're sort of we're sort of moving, um, getting much more focus on the United States and the U.S. markets for investors mm -hmm. um and you know so we we had an investor day in new york city last week um which was very successful and we started to build up more u.s investors who like this type of investment you know we're a business that's growing very quickly you know 20 30 percent growth every year um and and we're producing cash at the same time Half of our business is in the U.S. and it's our highest growth market. U.S. in contrast is growing at more than fifty percent each year. So overall, it's you know it's from an investment point of view, um, you know it's it's starting to gather momentum, and it's going from a bit like you mentioned earlier, Jack. You were talking about you know going back to the office and. Mm -hmm back to work i mean this is as the narrative moves people start to realize that, that, that there's something else there they can't see it at the moment they think somehow that we're a real estate company we're not and we don't actually have any real estate we're actually the middleman just like like airbnb or like uber between two parts of the market the mm -hmm. user and the provider um we work entirely in in uh, JV with property owners worldwide to provide the products on the other side to consumers that want to consume more and more. But um, yeah, look, overall, I think the investment case is starting to be picked up more and people are realizing the scale that it could be in the future. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's the the shares are they listed both? Are you listed now in the U.S. as well as the U.K.? Yeah, we were we were a Swiss company, right? And we but we're listed at the moment in the U.K. But from next year, we're going to be reporting in dollars as the reporting currency, and it's likely that we're going to move to U.S. GAAP as the accounting uh, method. It just makes it much easier to understand the business for U.S. investors and, in fact, for global investors. So does that mean you're going to come here to the U.S.? You're going to join it's us? A possibility in the future. I mean, look, <laughs> a lot of our business is in the U.S. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's very much a, a, a second step. Um, you know, it's, it's not something that we've decided to do yet. But what, we, what we're trying to do is communicate well with our investor base and to do that, to take out the volatility of European currencies, in particular sterling, we we decided to change to the dollar, and then to make it easy for U.S. investors to understand, change the U.S. GAAP accounting, um, which easier for U.S. investors than the European IFRS 16, which is complicated, more complicated, let's mm. say. So, you know, these are steps that we're taking. Um, and we have a growing American investor following, and we're very focused on communicating the story worldwide, but in particular to U.S. investors, because we are a U.S. business in the end. How, how does it work now? Because like you've probably seen what's going on in San Francisco, where you have this almost like doom loop of just crime and, and drugs on the street and everything, and the, you know, the buildings are empty. Is that maybe long term a good thing for you? That if somebody, you know, if it could kind of fix no. it up, you know, clean it up, oh. and that could be amazing, right? In my experience, uh, Jack, these things go through cycles. So mm -hmm. I've been around long enough to see cities go to the top of the pile and then fall right to the bottom. Um, I think. I, I did, having been in the U.S. last week, um, I think I saw major improvements in New York City. 
with regard to what was on the street. Washington, even more so, very clean and tidy. And there seemed to be, you know, it seemed to be better organized compared to previous visits. Um, so I think overall, you know, cities are going to have to compete more. I mean, you can't just be a city. You know, being a city is not enough. Having the transport coming into the city is not enough. You're going to have to focus on two things. It has to be a great place to work and most secure with great amenity. And secondly, you need affordable housing. If you don't have affordable housing, young people, especially young people with families, have to live too far out of the city to get affordable housing and the commute's too long. So this isn't, the battle here isn't between the cities and the workers, it's be, between the cities, the workers, and the elephant in the room is commuting. That's what people don't want to do. So in cities around the world where we see very affordable housing near the core of the workplace, these cities, no change, very successful, everything's full, everyone's happy. If you go to somewhere, you mentioned San Francisco, very expensive and difficult to get into the downtown. It's quite difficult to travel across the bay as well because of traffic problems and so on. So, and also people have to live quite a long way out to get affordable housing. So all cities have to re reinvent or focus more on the customer and the customer that pays the bills is normally the worker, you know, unless it's, you know, Disney, Florida or something, it's the workers that are paying the bills and it's the companies that are paying the bills. And, but you've got to create the right conditions and the companies will then come and thrive. So I think over the next 10 years, you're going to see a reinvention. I think it's already started in New York. Very, very apparent the difference between my last visit and this one. And that will have to happen all over the United States. Otherwise, as you're saying, the cities will empty out. People just won't want to be there. So it seems like a, a, there's a move towards the suburbs where I'll give you a you know, personal anecdote, commuting from where I am. I used to live in Manhattan. And it was pretty easy to get to work. Then you have a kid, two kids, you move to the suburbs, and then you realize the commute even though the realtor said, oh, don't worry about the commute. You realize, oh my gosh, it's just horrible. It's horrible. There's always a problem. There's always traffic. So that if you have offices in the suburbs, that's just amazing. Because then you go five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, okay. and then boom. And then, you know, it's so, so easy. You have your life back. We're trying to get them in about a 10 minute radius of wherever you would live, even in the, you know, the, where it might be 20 minutes, it would be, you know, I went also week before I was all around Minnesota, where we're, you know, we're really growing the network in, in the Midwest, for example. And, you know, where it's in the rural or countryside locations, there'd be a slightly longer travel time, but it's still short. And it's about convenience. So, you know, one of the problems everyone in the narrative keeps saying, well, it's either work from home or work from a city no it's actually a lot of people don't want to work from home but they do want to work locally so someone like you jack you get an office down the road you go into the city once a week once a month whenever you need to but you're not sort of obliged to go two hours every day or more to use a computer in a building that's inconvenient you know you can do that from anywhere but the fact is, all research shows, whilst it does suit some people to work from home, the vast majority work much better from an office, working with other people, either colleagues or people from other companies, you know, to, to get that social interaction and to have the break between home and work. It's quite important, you know, sort of socially, mentally, and from, from a productivity point of view. You know, it's sometimes quite tempting to get that extra half hour in bed and do a meeting in pajama bottoms and <laughs> shirt and tie. 
it's sort of you can't do that if you're going 10 minutes down the road mark 100 agree with you i can tell you from firsthand experience and maybe you can appreciate this as a customer because i during the pandemic i couldn't take being home because you know I, the all everything was closed down but I, after a while, and I don't know if you realize this, but here in the U.S., and I didn't know this because I would be in an office in Manhattan, it's noisier in the suburbs than it is sometimes in the city. You have yeah. building, you have you have the the lawnmowers, you have the those like you know leaf blowers, and it's nonstop all the yeah. time. So I went yeah. to I went to in, uh, uh, not far from me, a place called Short Short Hills, nice location, and I go there. 10, like maybe 10 minutes at most. I, I stopped getting my coffee, go there. It was quiet. It was yeah. nice. Got out of the house. No arguing with my wife and my kids. So no, there's, no. I'm telling you, no. if, if this helps you, this is like firsthand experience. So I could see and not, and then I decided I'm not going back to Manhattan anymore. This is crazy. Why would I pay like the rents in Manhattan just off the charts? It's way cheaper to have you know some a setup like this where you could drive there 10 15 10 minutes mm. and and your life is easier so i i see how I like yeah i see how this and is you playing out both as well so the way our system works yeah. is you can get you know take take a room take a desk near where you live but you can use anywhere in the system mm -hmm. so you can go to where near where you live one day maybe a week the next week, you can be in Atlanta, in New York, in Tokyo, if you want. We've got you know, well over 4,000 buildings now. Mm -hmm. But as a member, you can use all of them. And that flexibility to say, wherever I am, there's somewhere I can work and be productive is you know, one of the advantages. So it can be local, but it can be also at your destination. Yeah, it also sounds it's like great for the mental health and emotional well-being of people because that's such a it's such an important piece for companies now to promote that because I can just tell you here in the in the US people are miserable. It's crazy. Yeah. Like be, be, be prepared. If you kind of move here, Mark, we're out of our minds lately. <laughs> it's just nuts. So yeah, it's, it's a universal it's, thing. It's, it's not just the US actually. But... So you you're seeing it too where you are. It's it's wild. So by having that like Less of a commute, right? Knowing you can get there quicker, not having to wrestle with all the technology yourself. It's like one of those things like, oh, you know, it's, it makes you a little happier, right? It makes you a little bit Save, better. Saving, look, saving two hours a day feels pretty good. Mm -hmm. What you've got to do is fill it, do something else, you know, take up a take up a class in yoga or something, do something. You know, to and that is the you know the issue I think. But mental well-being is a big issue. It is you know we one of the most popular things when we ask people what do you like about being with us, they say we like the parties, we like the education, we like the social group, mm -hmm. as we do. We put on events for people, and you know that's they don't say hey I had a great desk or they say no actually the social part was actually quite, I really enjoyed that. Yes, I got my work done as well, but the first thing is always the, the social part because just as you say, people are miserable because they probably are spending too much time on their phone. I know I do, mm -hmm. head down, not talking to anyone. And then, you know, too much time, you know, in, in downtime, you know, you've got unlimited TV with Netflix, et cetera. And then you you sort of, but that social interaction is quite easy to miss out. And uh, so I think it's really important that is, and certainly our customers do, you know, we've got over 8 million users and that's what they rate highly. 8 million, that's amazing. Hmm. I don't know, wow. All right, when you mention parties, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. <laughs> when you mention parties, so you're not going to go Adam Newman, right? And go go off the charts and no, go no. crazy parties. They're not parties. They're, they're <laughs> sort of, they're generally cocktails with the theme. Yeah. But no, no, we don't do parties. Yeah. So, but um, it's, you know, keeping this, we're very focused on business. So, you know, our customers, you know, the companies 
paying for this and the individuals using us are, are serious about business. The social part is about meeting people and you know social is also about business you learn things you get inspired you make business contacts and so on all of this is in the mix there but no these are not sort of hedonistic parties um the, it's more like a it's an it's a sort of end of day drinks on a friday and i know you you have a vineyard so I guess yeah. the drinks will be very nice wine, I suppose. So the parties will be sophisticated with very lovely wine. Less, well, I, I can't imagine. get the wine to everywhere in the world, but um, um, I don't make enough of it for every one of our centers. But uh, yeah, no, we. it depends what it is around the world, but we do sort of sake appreciation, whiskey appreciation, these sort of things. So it's themed and, you know, give something for people to talk about, learn something. We also do educational presentations. You know, that's what people like. And hearing from other companies, a lot of our companies want to stand up and talk about what they do uh, in their own company. That also, all of that content is makes the going to something a, a, a much better experience. And just if I could delve back to this part, because, you know, there's a theme for a little bit here for digital nomads, where you can kind of go and work wherever you want to. And it sounds right. like, you know, with, with your company, uh, if let's say I want to go to, um, you know, Nashville and check it out. I don't have to worry about work. Just get my laptop, Absolutely. go over, right? Go to Nashville, enjoy the music yeah. scene. They're doing it. People are doing it. We, what we find is we did a series on um staycations they're called in europe i don't know what they're called in america but these are what you can see now is folks go, you know deciding i want to spend six months of the year in colorado mm -hmm. and they do it and they find somewhere to work locally with us and they basically rent something and live the life in colorado or florida or you know wherever in the world because it's a place to live i mean getting away from the winter um and or, or getting a new culture i mean you can quite literally work from anywhere today in the world and you can go into an office meet other people get immersed into that culture so it's it's um and quite a lot of people are doing it we see more and more people uh, in Europe, in the United States, that will be going more towards the coast, but not, you know, to, to get great places to live, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to great places to commute from. It's quite a different thing. It opens up the country. And where do you see it going? I, I, I guess it's just the trend is that you're just going to keep opening up more and more locations, I imagine, right? Yeah, we, we're making, there's still, you know, if you take the United States, mm -hmm. got about 1,200 locations, we've got 600 under construction, um, but there's still lots of white space. We think to do the US with a full network is around 20,000 locations. So, you know, we're still not even 10% mm -hmm. of the way there yet. So this, you know, if you think about 20,000 as a number, that's, there's about 20,000 McDonald's in the US to just give you an indication of what concentrations look like. So this is, as I said at the beginning here, this is about, we call it stepping stones across America. So you should be able to go really in one step, very large steps across America and be able to work from just about anywhere. That's our future roadmap. And we really see work as being something that's very, very portable. By the way, your office is actually in the cloud today already. It's not a physical place. Um, and But your ability to work from wherever is convenient is what drives you on. We're doing, by the way, more and more US airports so that you can work right, you know, when you're waiting for your plane. That's brilliant. You know, these are small workplaces, Again, I very insulated from noise where you can just do a Teams or a Zoom 
right in these cubicles, very, very popular. Um, so, you know, that continuum of work, I mean, we all want to get our work done as effectively as possible, quickly as possible, so that we can get on and do things. We, you know, have pastime, spend more time with our families, um, less time traveling. That's, you know, in the end, one of the benefits from technology, I mean, there are technology changes everything. What are the benefits? You know, one of the benefits is the ability to work from wherever. Uh, on a side note, with what happened with WeWork, you know, to go back to it, is that, you know, you don't, you don't take relish in somebody else's failure, but is that long-term good for you? Because maybe you can get some of those leases or you don't, because to my knowledge, I don't think there's a lot of other large competitors for what you're doing. So you're kind of running the show. Well, it's, I mean, this is going to be a huge industry. So mm -hmm. we're still, even though we've been doing it for more than 30 years, or I have, it's still right at the beginning of its evolution. We work, you know, basically, um, right idea, execution was a bit, uh, let's, let's call it a bit questionable. Mm -hmm. But they're in the right space. But it's, you've got, in this business, the execution has to be perfect. And it's a very detailed, very operationally intensive business. It's not something you can just get up and do. Yeah. A lot of people make that mistake. Um, but, you know, so WeWork has been a problem for us simply because it um, obviously has huge following. And it, we sort of get tied in with people say, are you also in difficulties like WeWork? We're oh. the opposite of WeWork. So our business is very profitable, growing very quickly. Um, they they are having to restructure, and we wish them the best in that. Um, but um, you know, it's just sometimes you can get the models wrong. Does it does it get frustrated, or did it get frustrating? Where you see because this happens a lot in the tech space, in the VC space, right? Where you get this charismatic person who's completely over the top, like a movie character. Right, really just off the charts, get all the limelight, but they they get the leases at the top and no one could, could you know says anything because oh but they're so charismatic, they're so brilliant. And then your 30 years experience hitting it away and, and they suck all the wind out of it. And now it shows like, all right, you're better off having sound advice, what you're saying, right? Really looking at the numbers, making sure you're paying the right, you know, you're not overpaying. You're, you're managing your expenses. You're not having crazy, you know, parties below, right? So it's just, you know, steady forward. And uh, you notice that too, right? Like you, like these, uh, these. Look, it's, there's it's many, right. I'm not sure if, uh, you know, Aesop's fables, which were written by someone called Aesop. And there's one that's the, the tortoise and the hare. Now, the hare was full of it, yeah. he could win the race, didn't practice, went partying, actually, I think, if I remember <laughs> right. The tortoise just kept on going. So we're not a tortoise. We're going pretty quickly ourselves, but we don't want to make mistakes. So we're investing our own money. So we, you know, we're a public company, but we feel as if mm -hmm. investing our own money in this. So we haven't had, um, you know, we ha right at the beginning, I had venture capital, money private equity money we paid that back double treble um in the early days before we went public but this is a business about discipline like all businesses um you know it's um it, you have to focus on the detail and and in particular with business that is as broad as ours is and with as many customers as we have you've got to be able to operationally be very strong. So, um, and, you know, sometimes when, you know, they, 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 you can see it, it happens in many industries where you get tortoise and the hare scenarios where you have one company that's been doing it for a long time and another company looks like mm -hmm. they're going to run right past, but they can end up getting into difficulties by going too quickly and not focusing on the details. 
I want to be respectful of your time, but can I ask you just one last question? Yes. To go back, you said you had about, when you start about 10 different businesses, it, how did you do, did they all work out? Did they fail? Because the reason I asked Mark, interviewing lots of people like yourself, I find out that a large majority have tried things and failed. And it seems that's just baked into it, you know, where I think a lot of people just view people who are now successful as it was a straight line going up and they don't realize, you know, you do, you know, you do well, then it, not well, then this works, then it doesn't work. And then you iterate and then it works and it's, and they don't realize it. And I, it really struck me by speaking to so many, you know, senior level executives, how much they fail and be open about it. So how, how with those 10 things, did they work, not work? Did they, did you learn from that? I learned from all of them. Yeah. Actually. yeah. And, but they all worked apart from the first one. Mm -hmm. which didn't work that well. Most of my, most of my businesses were always before their time. A bit like IWG is a bit before it was. <laughs> yeah. We started it pre-internet and pre-mobile phones. Um, but yeah, I mean, but look, I got my money back and that for me is a yeah. failure. But huge learning curve in all the things. So just to point something out, you know, I'm um, at the end of December here and looking in December as we always do. We've done all our budgets already, but I'm working through and saying now with our senior team, what have we learned? What are we going to change? So what we're doing is we go back and look at the budget and think about it again and saying, are we, what do we learn? Do we want to really do something different? And so once the numbers are done, you say, right, well, how can we improve things? And that sort of, you know, I think no matter how big the business, if you've got to stop and learn from what you're doing and say, and do that really deep review um, to say, you know, okay, what's now, What's the bit, what are we going to be like in three to five years' time? What do we want to change? So that, what I'm saying in a roundabout way, the yeah. learning process never ends. And by the way, even in 23, we make mistakes as a company. What we, you know, but if you, in my view, if you're not making mistakes, then you're really not trying. Mm -hmm. And you just got to make sure you make small mistakes and don't do them too, twice, you know, trying to, avoid repetition and um but business is a learning process it is always a mountain range it is never a plane this is great i really appreciate you taking time out of your day this this is awesome and i really appreciate it because it's for the people who will be watching this and i'm going to write about this you know for forbes it i i love these stories because you know, you had 10 different businesses, you hit on the one, hit, knocked it out of the park, but you're practical, you're, 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 you're mindful of what you're doing, and it gives people hope. See, these kind of stories, I think, to me, this is what I really like doing, because it makes people say, wait a minute, maybe I could do it. You know, it doesn't have to be to the same degree where you are now. If I may, okay. just one final thing here. A lot yeah. of people ask me, family, friends, friends mm -hmm. of theirs. They say, well, I want to get into business. And I said, look, it's very tough. It's much harder. E you want easy an easy life, go get a job. Hard life, start a business. But if you're going to do it, stop talking about it and do it. And do it, if possible, while you're young. And 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 sort of go out and, 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 and go for it. If you, but you have to be prepared to both learn and to fail a bit, you're probably going to fail before you win, unless you're lucky. Mm -hmm. And but you most important thing is get out there and do it. Too many people talk about it and don't do it. And the world needs more entrepreneurial people out there to, you know, to make a better world for the future. It's not just politicians that do that, it's business people that change things for the better, for people, for the planet. You know, they're the people that really are the engine room and, and there's always a lack of them and we need more. Well, speaking of that, given given what you do, is, are there any ideas for people who are budding entrepreneurs 
that you would say, hey, here's some areas that seem very ripe for growing and building something and making something oh, happen. Anything I that strikes you? I, I can't give my ideas away for free. I have about <laughs> 10, <laughs> 10 okay. I can't do anything about. But um, <laughs> no, there's, look, the opportunities always are right in front of you. So if you're a good entrepreneur, you're looking at what's that you're trying to find out what's not there you know this is you come back to the the invention of the iphone everyone had phones but they said what people want is a personal device that does a lot more than just be a phone and let's design a beautiful one as we do it so there are gaps all over the place so many opportunities um for good entrepreneurial people to find a gap, fill the gap. And that's it. Just look around. Everything you do every day of your lives, you'll find gaps. Mm -hmm. And they're not all technology gaps. There's very practical things um, that, that are out there that people will buy and will invest in. And, and yeah, I think a lot of the opportunities for me, if I were young, would all be around um, sustainability. Not so much, you know, this is about how to recycle things, how to avoid waste. And, you know, what tech, what can be done to, you know, change the, you know, the, the amount of consumption, how can, how can that be changed? Packaging. My big thing is packaging. You know, how can the world work with less packaging? Huge opportunity for great entrepreneurs here. Some are already doing it, but there's, you know, it, it it it's there's a massive opportunity there using technology to try and make things better in that sense so look i could talk about this for another three hours so i'm not going to do that jack okay but it's all around you opportunity well thank you i really appreciate you taking the time out it was great speaking to you again and i'm i'm, I'm so happy to see your success i'm so glad that you're building up here in the u.s and i i think I'm going to go get another, uh, I'm going to go back to either Short Hills or somewhere else. I think I might want to try, seriously, I'm going to try, I think I'm going to try, if my wife and kids are cool with it, to go to different locations. And I could give you some yeah. feedback and say, hey, this is what That's it's true. like. Just give you like you know, off the record, hey, here's what I found out over here yeah, in you know, right. Texas. Because I would love to do that just to get away and use it because it is cool. I really enjoyed using it. And and I need to get out of the house because yes. <laughs> I'm working remote again in the so, house. So I got to get out. It gives me an excuse. I can yeah. tell my wife, it's not just me. You know, Mark was telling me to do it, to go out there, go to different locations. Take your wife with you. See, see, no, see she wants to get away from me, Mark. Well, oh, right. Okay. <laughs> She's That's tired. Thing. I can't advise on that. <laughs> after like 25 plus years she's she's seen enough of me she's like go 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 to different places so thank you very much i really appreciate right, your time great pleasure thank you very no much pleasure. indeed thanks. thank you and thank Goodbye. you simon for setting up thank you sir bye-bye